to the Action Podcast. Here's your host, my dad. And just like that, we are nearing the end of season three of the podcast. Thanks for listening each time we put out another episode. It is so greatly appreciated. So today I've asked one of my dear friends to come and share his story. Our guest and I have been friends for many years, and I have to say that he has certainly ministered to me with how he has navigated adversity in his life. Well, without giving a too much away, please welcome my dear friend to the podcast, Gary Durbin. Thanks, Matt. It is great to be on your podcast. I actually listen to your podcast, so I'm a fan, so I'm honored to be on it, not just because you're my friend. I actually <laughs> like the podcast. Dude, I, I feel like um, this has been a long time coming. I, I've looked for uh, all different kinds of angles about how, how Gary and I are going to get on the podcast together, and i um, just really excited for you to share your story today, and I, I'm, I think it's going to be a great uh, testimony for our listeners to hear. Before we get into that, um, can you just share a little bit about who Gary Dermot is and, and give us a, a, an idea of, of, of who you are? Well, who I am is a follower of Jesus. That is a super spiritual answer, but that is the absolute truth. Yeah. Um, and I'm also husband to Jenny mm-hmm. and a dad to Josh and Jade. And I've been a worship leader full time in the local church for the last 20 years. Uh, grew up in ministry. My dad was a music minister my whole life, which is the old term for worship leader. Mm-hmm. And we were all over the country. I spent a lot of time in the Midwest and Florida. We were at a church in uh, Kansas for several years. And then God led me into full-time ministry um, after I we were in Florida when I was in high school, graduated I got married at a young young age. I was like 21, and it was a few years after that that God really called me into the ministry, and a door opened. I went through it, and I've been leading worship ever since. And so um, being a worship leader has taken you to a lot of different churches. Talk to uh, our audience a little bit about the journey um, that you went through in in going to some different places, but then really how you got to Ohio. Yeah, so I did not go to college. I mean, I did, but I dropped out. And I I did that too. (laughs) Yeah. And so um, as a a young guy I was had as a musician I had dreams mm-hmm. of music stuff yeah and then God introduced me to himself through worship in a fresh way and that became a natural shift for me as a young guy as a young musician that loved the Lord that loved to minister to people it was just a natural fit to go yeah let me lead them in worship so as a young guy I was uh, leading worship, and then yeah, there was a guy, a pastor in Illinois. After I had surrendered to that call, that heard about me and took a chance on me, mm-hmm. and he hired me. I was with him for almost a decade in Illinois and at a church in Florida, and then um, I accepted a position in Denver, Colorado, when I was like in my early thirties. Was there for about four and a half years. That season was coming to a close. I knew there was. I knew that and I was really open to something else and this church in Ohio popped on the radar. I talked to the pastor and realized, man, we got this would be a great fit and mm-hmm. felt like God was opening the door. I walked through it and I've been here for six and a half years. And so you have been in the ministry of worship for how long? A little over 20 years. So 20 years is, is a long time to be doing that. And so in that 20 years, talk to me a little bit about your life and life with the kids and you know what that looked like marriage all that kind of stuff yeah so like i said we were married early and about a couple years into ministry we got pregnant and with my son josh and he was born in 2004 then we had jade my daughter in 2008 and like i said i was in full-time ministry leading worship doing all kinds of things in the ministry Mm -hmm. and in conjunction with ministry I also was it was kind of my marriage as well you know it's like 20 something years and 
Unfortunately, in 2019, a red flag popped up in our marriage um, that I believed was a false alarm. And then 2020 hit with COVID. And a couple weeks after COVID hit, uh, the false alarm became a reality. And that led to us getting a divorce in 2020. So, yeah, that that was tough, uh, traumatizing for me and for for the kids. I, I know because I walked through this with you, mm-hmm. this was not on your radar. Well, there's that term, beauty from ashes. So divorce is like a death in a way. Mm-hmm. And uh, one, one song that I heard from an artist named Jason Gray, he has a song called Death Without a Funeral, mm-hmm. and it's about divorce. And that's the way, what divorce is. You know, there's no ceremony. There's no celebration of life or anything like that. It's just this is ending, and it's awful, and it's horrible, and there, there's, no, right. there's no silver lining, especially at the beginning. So for me personally, um, when I realized that we were heading towards divorce, I certainly wanted to save it. Um, and so the morning after I will call it, I was in my pastor's office, just absolutely destroyed. And he was so kind because here I am a full-time worship leader at a local church. And it looks like that I may be getting a divorce possibly, maybe. So I was sitting in his office like six in the morning telling him, well, what I had discovered and what's going on. And he, he was so kind in one in many ways, but I think one of his first acts of kindness to me was that he looked at me and said, well, from what you're telling me and with what you're telling me is the truth, then I see no reason why your employment has to end here at the church. Mm. So that was an act of kindness of, on his part to say, hey, listen, there's a, there's a lot of crap going on in your, in your head right now. Mm-hmm. Let me just remove that worry for a second. If this is what's going on, then we intend on keeping you here. Mm-hmm. So that was super uh, amazing. Didn't exactly... Um, make me feel a whole lot better or anything. I mean, my world was falling apart. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I experienced anxiety for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. I would get up in the morning during that time and it was COVID. So we were all at home, Mm -hmm. couldn't go anywhere. So I'd get up in the morning and I started experiencing this anxiety that everybody talks about. never had it before and Mm -hmm. I couldn't breathe and I would have to get up in the morning and I would have tell myself before you know 5 30 in the morning i'd get up to to just be with the lord and get in the, i was in the psalms at the time and and i would the first thing i have to do is just tell myself to breathe mm-hmm. and so it, it was heavy anxiety heavy uh depression all those things just worry the natural things that come with it yeah. i was um i learned very quickly i was very very concerned about my kids and what this was going to do to my kids. Mm -hmm. And I just, I had a feeling early on that this was going to head towards divorce. I was going to do everything I could to save it, but I learned quickly that it it takes two. And uh, what I learned was that my anxiety was, a lot of it was rooted in my worry for my kids. I was afraid they were going to get destroyed. I was afraid they were going to walk away from their faith. All those things that you worry about. And when um, my kids were babies, we dedicated them. But in that moment in 2020, that's what I tell people is that's when I surrendered my kids Mm -hmm. to the Lord. And that really was a big help to me in my anxiety. I noticed the difference in that. Um, But unfortunately, we were not able to save the marriage. It does take two. And we attempted some counseling, but it it was obvious that, that it was coming to an end and we had to mutually make a decision hey this is over Mm -hmm. and we did and that was summer of 2020 and um yeah and it was it was a it was a rough time share um a little bit about what it's like not not that it's different for somebody in ministry or a worship leader but i think there's a different pressure 
um, than maybe somebody else going through a divorce. I don't think any divorce on this planet is easy. Mm-hmm. But there's a different thing when every Sunday you're up front in front of the congregation. Um, what was that experience like for you with our church in general and then specifically to our congregation and our our pastoral team? And, and what did you experience through that? COVID was a horrible thing for everyone. The silver lining for COVID for me was during the worst days of that, we were not gathering as a church. Mm-hmm. So I was coming in once a week recording the worship set, which I think you were a part of mm-hmm. some oh, of that. Sure. Yeah. And so it was good because I was just coming and recording and going home. So there was no like meeting people in the lobby and having the ministry um, front where I have, you know, mm-hmm. want to love people and talk to people and all that stuff. I didn't have to do that. So I think during the worst times of that, um, yeah, I didn't have to do that. And I think that was a good thing for me. But then we started gathering again. And so, yeah, I had to get in front of people. And for me, um, it was really, it was really hard at times to lead worship, yeah. knowing that I was going through a divorce. Um, it was, it brought a whole new depth though, as a worship leader, because all of a sudden these songs are just destroying me, Yeah, which is in a kind of a good way. Yeah. When everything went down and I knew things were, my world was blowing up before that I was definitely leaning on Jesus in my life. But what I tell people is when everything went down, I fell on Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for that because I think divorce is a source for a lot of people walking away from the faith. And so I'm grateful that I didn't walk away from the faith. Mm-hmm. Praise to the Lord for that. Yeah. Um, so the, the silver lining and the beauty from ashes from my story is that I f- fell in love with Jesus in a whole another way, in a whole, I don't know, another depth. Mm-hmm. Um, he's all that I had, like literally. Yeah. Of course my kids are there, but they can't come alongside of me in this. You know, yeah. I was very alone, but... It was like alone in the point of I either turn to Jesus or not. Mm -hmm. And when I did, he was absolutely there for me. And I felt his loving arms in so many different ways, including my church. You know, I felt his arms from friends like you and from my church family and from my and my parents. And, you know, just wrapping he was wrapping his arms around me. Yeah, with all those things. I think a lot of times in these situations, what what I I would love for this story to help people is um, obviously divorce happens, and there's probably not a church in in, in the country that doesn't uh, get affected by this. What are some things that that maybe our church did well with you, and maybe some things that we should be mindful as congregants if somebody a pastor or somebody in the congregation is going through a divorce like what would be some things that you would share go hey these are things to be thinking about when somebody's going through this because it's really easy for us to ostracize people who are going through stuff like this that's a great question i think it's hard for people to be single in the church period Mm -hmm. uh i think it's really hard to be a single and divorced in the church because a lot of ministry is based around the family when yep. it comes to most local churches. So that's just a, that's just a natural thing uh, that makes it tough. What, what our church family did really well is we put a heightened sense on not gossiping about it. Because here it is, Gary, the worship leader. We're, we're a fairly large church. Everybody knows who I am. A lot of most people know who I am. If they don't know my name, they know my face. Mm-hmm. And so as word got around, people started finding out um, nobody was approaching me. Nobody was asking me details. That was good. Mm -hmm. I think what the church can do better and and it's not anything that is a conscious thing that I think people do. But I don't I I think when you know someone's going through a divorce, just reach out to them. Mm-hmm. Just check in on them regularly because it's a very lonely time. You know, you, even like you guys and my friends, I mean, you guys are married and you have kids and all this stuff. So you feel like the third will uh, a lot. Um, but 
yeah, I think it, th- that's one thing I would would share with people is yeah, if you see someone, just reach out to them and invite them to stuff. Because I found myself in a time where I was co-parenting, and every other week I was by myself twiddling my thumbs and yeah and that was the other good thing is i fell in love with music again so every other week music became my girlfriend and and i just wrote a ton of songs and recorded a lot and um you you did right a A, lot a lot (laughs) (laughs) you you were on a war path (laughs) with writing i mean uh you and i do a lot of writing together and we've written a lot of songs together and uh during that time it was uh uh, I felt like my email was it was an onslaught of hey here's a new song here's a new song I was like dude I can't I, I couldn't for, if I did this for the next five years I couldn't keep up with what you're writing right now talk about that though talk about your writing yeah. during that time one of the, the other thing my pastor pushed me on was when I was going through it pretty hard he looked at me and said hey are you writing and I, at the time I was writing a um, worship devotional book for teams that we're actually using now I said yeah I'm writing this book and he's like no 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 are you writing about what you're going through? And I was like, no, he goes, you should. Mm -hmm. And so I just decided to do that. And I went home. I remember that week and, um, I mean, I, I was the lowest of lows and I sat down and wrote probably one of the most pure songs I've ever written in my life. And it was just a love song to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I honestly didn't even intend on sharing it with anyone. I was like, this is just for Jesus. Now I'm sharing it with people and I'm hoping it helps people. But that kind of started a whole thing of, I, I'm like, yeah, I want to keep doing this. I'm going to keep writing. And I wrote probably 50 to 60 songs in a, in a course of a year because mm-hmm. it was just kind of my thing I did mm-hmm. when I was by myself. Um, it was therapeutic. It was helpful for me. I was going through a lot of counseling at the time too, and um, but it was very therapeutic for me to to sit down and that's just what I do. I'm a songwriter. We all have our things that we do, you know, and we kind of figure out what's therapeutic for for me, and that was definitely one of those things. Since, since we're talking about it, can can you share about the worst days and yeah. the project? Yeah. So the first song I wrote was called "Worst Days," and then uh, over the course of uh, over a year I just kept writing and there were, there were some songs that were just like to this day I would never let anyone hear them mm-hmm. they're just really dark <laughs> they were and depressing mm-hmm. and um, sometimes I was mad at God and I'd write a song about it mm-hmm. but uh, out of all those 50 or 60 songs this last summer I was looking back at them and I've realized that I had like seven of these songs that I can make a project out of that were worship songs to Jesus but but I realized these were songs that were kind of were their little laments mm-hmm. they were sad they're not happy joy joy songs um, but those were the that was the kind of music I was looking looking for when I was really sad and down I was I was looking for sad music mm-hmm. uh, at the time just to be sad and had a hard time finding it sometimes. So I realized, man, I think I have something to offer here. I don't really um, think it'll ever get out in a major way. And the beauty of it is that I, I could care less. I, I just came to the point where like, I'm gonna take these demos. I'm gonna have my tech director, he did it on the side for me and he remixed them. And they're basically glorified demos. And I just put out a project uh, actually last week called Worst Days. And it's called Worshiping Through Grief. And it's seven songs that hopefully will lead people to worship Jesus in their grief and their sadness, no matter what they're going through. And it's really more of a personal worship time. I I love it because I I don't know, um, being in the Christian music industry as long as I was, listening to Christian music as long as I have, of anybody really tapping into that niche of most of the time we think of worship music and it's tapping into the joy uh, which is great and it's tapping in but really going into the dark spot is almost counterintuitive to the christian industry as we know it Mm -hmm. but it's it's a true emotion yeah it's a true place i mean i i wouldn't have a job as a mental health therapist if that didn't exist and i i think sometimes being able to 
um, sit in the stuff and be okay with not being okay yeah. is so important. And I, I, I love the fact, I mean, it's, um, I'm sure <laughs> as you were doing it, like, who's going to listen to this? This is not feel good no. music. But I think so many more people can connect and relate to it. And where mm-hmm. it came out of is such a pure place. It's, uh, mm-hmm. I think it's a, it's a great resource. I know it was therapeutic for you, but I think it could be therapeutic for others too. That's my that's what I'm I'm hoping for it. Mm-hmm. That's that's my only hope for it, honestly. Yeah, I've recorded a lot in my life and written a lot, and when I've put out, you know, albums and EPs, and I've done a couple books, and when you when I've every one of those projects I've put out, there's a portion of my motivation that is a little prideful. It's like I really do hope, man, maybe somebody will pick this up or. Mm-hmm. I can tell you, Matt, this is the first project I think I've ever done where I, I don't, I could care less. It's like, mm-hmm. I just want to get it out there. And I, I'm just picturing that person that's sitting alone mm-hmm. in their room, listening to it and getting a connection with Jesus. That's, it's almost, that's, I guess that's my way of leading worship to that person because yeah. I've been that person. Yeah. Um, would you be okay sharing a little bit about your therapeutic journey and um, kind of the intersect of where Emerge um, kind of came alongside you during that time? Yeah. Well, as a close friend, I came to you because um, I was looking, I knew I needed to get into counseling. Mm-hmm. And you immediately connected me with my counselor. They quickly. Um, diagnosed me with PTSD and recommended that I go through EMDR therapy. Mm -hmm. I did that. It was very intense, uh, very painful, but incredibly healing Mm -hmm. and brought me to the light, Mm -hmm. the light of truth. And, you know, I quickly realized that there was a lie that I was believing that, which that's the first step in it. You know, like there's a, there's a lie that you're believing behind all this and it was easy to to figure out mine mine was inadequacy it was Mm -hmm. like i'm inadequate yeah and uh so we attacked that and he he helped me get to that truth of that i'm fearfully and wonderfully made Mm -hmm. and so emdr therapy really helped me get there i think it took us like i don't know seven or eight sessions uh, months of doing it and it was hard and painful and tiring, but it's, but it ended with me. One of my last sessions, I started laughing, and yeah. he was like, "What's going on? What's going?" I'm like, and I just realized that he's like, "I'm believing this lie mm-hmm. from," and I was thinking of someone that I shouldn't trust at all. Yeah, and I was believing that person over everybody else in my life that was saying I was adequate. So, anyway, it was <clears throat> yeah, it was very helpful. I think um, I was super proud of walking alongside you through that and seeing how you navigated all of that because uh, you're absolutely right. That process is super hard and a lot of people just want to avoid it. They just want to turn. They want to run from it. They want to dive into addiction. They want to dive into unhealthy relationships. You name it. But following through with the process and, and diving in I love you know I love EMDR it's like um, there's probably 10 million things in the world you'd rather do in that moment than what you're actually doing but that's the only thing is addressing the issues is what's going to allow you to heal and the, the more you avoid and ignore it so many we live in a culture where we just want to avoid and ignore and it just causes more and more pain to build and build, build. Um, I was just super proud of you, man, the, w- the way you walked through all of that. It, it was tremendous. And, you know, uh, myself and a couple other guys, you know, we're, we're praying for you all the time. Mm-hmm. And we're getting together and, and texting a lot. And, and um, I don't think any one of us would have blamed you for, you know, not keeping your head up and, and not taking the high road and, but you did. You did. You took the high road and you, and you kept focus on Jesus the entire time. And I think that mentored to all of us, too. And hmm. so I just I want to tell you that because I think it's um, it was a ministry in, in itself, the way you handled all of that, um, that difficult time that you went through. Thanks, man. I mean, it, <clears throat> that, I appreciate it. that means a lot. I uh, I did get through it. I got on the other side of it. Mm-hmm. 
uh, I'm not Jesus, so I wasn't perfect through it. Mm-hmm. Um, had some speed bumps that I had to get through, uh, which you you're aware what uh, aware of. I remember calling you at night, <laughs> just freaking out. I remember, it, but I also experienced the grace of Jesus so hard too in that time too. I, I, one of the, my favorite stories I love to tell people is when I was in the, just in the lowest of lows during that year. I always got so mad at God. I had never been mad at God, but I realized I'm mad at God. Mm-hmm. And I just remember being by myself and I legit cussed out God. Mm-hmm. Legit. And um, I just remember later that night, it's almost like I was giving God the silent treatment after that. You know, like you go off on somebody and you walk away, you don't talk for the rest of the day. Yeah. I remember laying in my bed at that, that night just by myself and coming down and going, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And I just, I just felt him go, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, it was, it was one of those, it was a hard, hard year, but man, Jesus is so good. You know, yeah. that's like the beauty from ashes from all of it. So let's talk a little bit about then, um, after you get through that year, um, you did a lot of therapy, you, um, leaned into a lot of really great relationships, friendships, uh, I think our our leadership and pastoral team at the church was awesome mm-hmm. through that. Um, but then talk to me about what then transpired in the next, I don't know, phase of life, the next, you know, I think you know where I'm headed with that. Um, talk to me about what God opened up as far as what was next. Yeah. So when you get divorced, that's another thing I would tell people is, well-meaning people will come up to you and the what probably one of the most common things that people say to someone who's going through a divorce is you're going to find someone else. <laughs> <laughs> There's someone really great for you out there. And a couple things I think go through your mind. Like mine, I, I was like, I didn't want anything to do with that. And initially, like I was scared of women, I think for a, for a little bit. Understand and so. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I got Jesus. That's all I need right now. And then I, then you come to a point where you're growing and you realize I do, that is all I need. All I need is Jesus. And then my prayer journal is filled with, I don't need a wife. I don't need a wife. I just need you. And I think that's a great spot to, to get to We're we're, we just launched a divorce care ministry at our church that I'm leading. And that's one of the big things I hit because when you hit this divorce time, I think the natural inclination is to think I need someone else. Mm Mm-hmm. That will ease the pain. That will fill the void. And that's a bad route to go um, in order yeah. to, to ease the pain and to, to heal. So um, that was kind of my mindset and heart set. And, and then in 2021, in the summer of 2021, uh, I struck up a conversation with an old friend from uh, – she, she was – in the church that I grew up in, in Kansas, where my dad was the worship leader. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't talked for 30 years, but we were Facebook friends, like ever since Facebook was invented kind of thing, but we hadn't really interacted. I knew she had gone through a divorce several years ago, but we hadn't really talked or anything. And um, we just bumped into each other in a comment thread on Facebook and then started messaging each other regularly talking about Jesus, talking about scripture, talking about books we're reading. We're both songwriters sharing songs together. And we were basically heading towards that. We had this attraction, but we didn't really, we didn't act on it for like a few months. Mm -hmm. We just kept talking here and there. And then finally we had, uh, we, we finally decided to talk on the phone, um, in August of 2021. Mm -hmm. And it was like, a rocket after that. It was like, it was a rocket. (laughs) My poor friends like Matt were like, probably they were a little concerned probably, but, um, it was a very quick courtship that led to an engagement. And then we got married in February and I am, I am so grateful Mm -hmm. for Jenny. She is the most amazing partner in life that I could ever imagine. We are, but, and I think, I, I think she feels the same way about me. Me Um, too. But it's just a beautiful place to get to and uh, definitely a picture of redemption for sure. 
it, it it's amazing. It really is. Your your guys' story is amazing. But I think uh, uh, the reason it works so well is you guys put God first. You put yeah. you put your relationship mm-hmm. with Jesus first. And um, I want to circle back to what you had said because I think so many people who are going through a failed marriage or failed relationship, not even maybe they haven't gotten to marriage, but they immediately want to fill that gap with somebody else. Sure. And that that hole, that loss cannot be filled properly by somebody else. And what you're doing is essentially you're setting the next relationship up for failure if you're expecting them to fulfill all of those right. wounds, all those hurts. And you know, the journey that you went on and, and you and I had countless conversations, how important it was for you to get to a place where you felt you were able to get through that storm. Not that it's, I mean, you're going to have experience uh, for the rest of your life around that. And your kids are going to experience that. Divorce is not easy. But really doing the work to allow yourself to heal so that you're not dependent on somebody trying to heal that. I I think you can be in a healthy relationship again when you do the work that you did. And and I, I think a lot of people... Um, they don't do that, and they they get into that next relationship too quick, and that's where a lot of, I think, issues. That's where we talk about bringing the past into the the current relationship that that causes yeah. issues. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Absolutely. Um, you mentioned the uh, divorce care group. I think we should talk about that a little bit mm-hmm. because I think it's great what you and Jenny are doing, and uh, have such a great ministry that's being built out of our church right now. Yeah, Divorce Care is a a nationwide program that a lot of churches do, and it's something that I got into a couple years ago, and I went through it a couple times and at another church. I wanted to be anonymous, so I went like 30 minutes away to another church, and so I wasn't like Gary, the worship leader guy that everybody knows, Mm -hmm. and I was able to just be vulnerable and honest, and so it was was definitely helpful in my healing. Uh, Divorce Care is awesome. It's like a support group. It's not counseling. It's just a time where you can get 13, a 13-week 13 program. You can show up and be with other divorced people that are going through the same thing that you're going through. There's definitely nuances to, to all of our stories. But the common thread is that we're all going through divorce. And um, it's just really healing and refreshing to go into a room with people. Mm-hmm. And, and then you know there is no judgment at all. You know, yeah. we're all going through the same thing. So it's it's a support group. It's something that I looked forward to every week when I was in my lowest because I was lonely. And it was so nice to be able to, to meet with those people and, mm-hmm. and talk about it. Uh, it's Bible-based. It offers guidance in a very practical way in the different things that you encounter with divorce. So after Jenny and I got married um yeah we we decided to bring it to our church the program and we launched it this last fall and it's not for any um phase of like you can be going through a divorce you could have been divorced for years it's it's open to anybody that's experienced that so it's not yeah i mean if 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 you're somebody who's been divorced for a long time it still would be yeah appropriate for you absolutely yeah we have people that are going through it right now and then we have people that have been divorced for five to seven years and they just didn't fully heal from it and they wanted to make sure they were doing okay. That's good. So a couple things. I want to talk about your podcast too Mm -hmm. because I think it's another great resource and um, share a little bit about uh, the podcast that that you've been doing. So I just launched the podcast because I don't have enough things going on. (laughs) Um, I launched a podcast called More Than a Worship Leader Podcast. I, I wrote a book several years ago called More Than a Worship Leader, mm-hmm. and that has just done really well. Shockingly, I had you know I done no promotion. I just put it on Amazon, and a bunch of people have have bought it, mm-hmm. and that led me to writing a uh, companion piece called More Than a Band, which is a worship team devotional that our team is going through right now. I just launched that this last summer. And then I had this dream of just doing a podcast just because honestly, I thought it, I think it would be, it's just fun Mm -hmm. to do a podcast. It just hits all those creative juices for me. It's a side project. I can just have fun with it. And then I, I thought of all these worship leaders that I know all over the country that epitomize this idea of more than a worship leader, which is basically not the person on stage that's just a diva and a rock star, but 
a, a legit person that loves people off stage mm-hmm. and on stage. So I'm interviewing a bunch of people like that all over the country. I put out one episode a month and uh, having a blast with it. Dude, and I think it's great. I, th- I think it's a really cool platform. And um, I'll put all these links for all the million things that you're involved in <laughs> in, in the liner notes. And if you're interested in anything Gary's doing, you can go to GaryDurbin.com uh, uh, for all, mm-hmm. all of these things. Uh, Gary, is there anything else you'd like to share uh, with our audience, uh, anything, any last, any last word? Yeah. I mean, one, another gift that came out of my season of, um, sadness and divorce and hardship was learning that these times, uh, these times of grief are seasons Mm -hmm. and there's, there's storms of life. One beautiful truth that I learned out of that God taught me is that storms and seasons are not forever. Mm-hmm. So as I was going through that, he taught me that. And I was like in the storm is in that season. And I was in it going, this is going to end. I'm going to get on the other side of this. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. So I was able to stand in that storm and stand in that season and look to him and say, thank you, Lord. And then the other beautiful thing that, uh, I knew, but learned mm-hmm. was that God is with me mm-hmm. and that is all I need literally. And, and if we can all just grasp that and believe it and have faith, we're going to fail believing that we're going to fail grasping that at times. And we're going to look to other things and other people, but man, if we can just for the most part, go through life and go, man, God is with me. That's all I need. Put your arms around me, Lord, as we go through this storm and go through this season that's all I need that and I'll get through it I'm never alone God is with me the storm and the season will end that's one of the songs I wrote was storms and seasons and um, yeah so if, if I yeah if anyone's going through that at this point it, it will come to an end things will get better mm-hmm. and right now God is with you well said thank you my friend thank you for your time thanks for sharing your story it, it, it means the world to me to um be able to um see you on the other side of that storm you know Mm -hmm. sitting with you through that process you know i I, uh, my heart was breaking for you and your family and your kids and um but to see how god has redeemed that has just been it's been a, a huge testimony to his goodness and appreciate you sharing yes praise the lord Well, I really appreciate Gary and his willingness to be vulnerable with his story and also having the hope of helping others navigate the difficulties of divorce. Divorce certainly can be devastating, and I know going through life and experiencing pain and loss um, can be so difficult. So thank you, Gary, for sharing this, uh, especially being in a ministry and how difficult uh, that, that storm in his life was. Like we said, every storm has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and this too shall pass. Just so you know, uh, immediately following our episode today, keep listening, uh, because Gary's song, Worst Days, is going to play in its entirety. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to give us a like or a share. Well, until next time, or when our Savior comes, God bless. days of my life I found you there patiently waiting for me you reached and you picked me up when I could barely breathe on my own now I know
In the first days of my life You were there Knowing the plan for me Writing your name on my heart And giving me eyes to see Oh, how I clearly see Now I know I'm in love All I want is your love Pouring over me Raining down like a flood Cleansing me from the mud Setting my heart free fire is not fun and it burns like hell and I feel everything I know I can't go on by myself then I feel you smile at me because all you want is me Now I know I'm in love All I want is your love Pouring over me Raining down like a flood Cleansing me Say yeah.